I thank the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to present this case. Actually, this is not a new case. This is an update. This presentation is an update on a case that we've presented uh, three years ago, or four years ago, uh, in the same meeting. Uh, just to refresh your memory, uh, this was a 27-year-old female presenting with a long history of chronic constipation. Uh, she was previously managed conservatively and was hospitalized several times for abdominal distension and dehydration. Uh, and she was managed by intravenous fluids, analgesics, nasogastric tube decompression for several days with some improvement. Her endoscopy showed um, a very peculiar finding. Her endoscopy was very uh, peculiar in that she, uh, she had a ring-like isolation uh, in the uh, rectus sigmoid region. Uh, my proctus sigmoiditis with circumferential ring isolation. And histopathologically, she had signs, of, she had combined signs of two different entities. On one side, she showed signs of um, ischemia, ischemic colitis, in the form of uh, denudation of the surface epithelium, disorganization of the architecture, some uh, apparent dysplastic changes of the uh, lining epithelium or the glandular uh, component of the uh, colon, uh, together with uh, heavy, heavy, relatively heavy mixed acute and chronic inflammatory cellular infiltrate and edema and, uh, of the lamina propria and congestion with a few small uh, crypt abscesses, and uh, this infiltrate was so heavy that it infiltrated the uh, muscularis mucosa, and there was an element of lymphoid hyperplasia. And, uh, although uh, this was um, a 27-year-old female, we do not we do not expect to find lymphoid hyperplasia with this uh, uh, strength in a 27-year-old female. Uh, so she was uh, given a double diagnosis. Uh, she was diagnosed as chronic active colitis with an element of ischemic colitis. Now, chronic active colitis may uh, carry a diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease, especially ulcerative colitis. But to diagnose ulcerative colitis, you have to have two uh, cardinal criteria, which are basal plasmocytosis and disorganization of the glandular architecture. And although this patient did have disorganization of the glandular architecture, in view of ischemic findings in her biopsy, a healed uh, ischemic colitis may show uh, uh, glandular architectural distortion, just like the one seen in inflammatory bowel disease. So I refrain from uh, diagnosis IBD in this case. And actually, it went undiagnosed to say uh, uh, to come to a final conclusion because she has inflammation and she has uh, ischemia, but we don't know the cause. Uh, the follow-up of the case, the new part of the scenario of this case, came on uh, February uh, 2015 when there was marked dilatation of the whole colon with lumen markedly dilated and loaded with fecal matter involving electric sigmoid lesion with no masses. And the small bowel was not dilated with a competent ileocecal valve. On December 2016, uh, there was a deterioration of her condition accompanied by dysphagia vomiting and abdominal bloating. She sought medical advice and she was diagnosed with volvulus of the sigmoid colon and she underwent a sigmoidectomy with the left iliac colostrum. She went to, she went to a, a pathology uh, lab who diagnosed her as ischemic colitis and then she came to me uh, um, for a second opinion and there were signs of ischemic colitis previously, previously diagnosed but in view of the long history of the patient, I just uh, had to take a look at the, uh, um, the ganglia of the colon. And um, uh, sure enough, I found that the, uh, on H and E slides, I found that the number of the ganglia in the Auerbach's plexus uh, were suboptimal, although they were there, but they were not in the frequency that I would like to see in a normal biopsy. So I went ahead and I did an immunohistochemistry, uh, immunohistochemical marker for uh, 
the ganglia and which is neuron-specific enolates. Uh, and sure enough, there were very few ganglion cells in the Auerbach's plexus. And to me, this was a diagnosis of hypogangliosis of a colon. It was not a total uh, true Hirschsprung disease, but she definitely was hypogangliotic. Now, just to give you an idea about what you expect uh, to see in a normal ganglionic colon, this is uh, a normal ganglionic colon showing uh, these brown uh, uh, stains are staining the ganglion cells in the mycelium plexus, and these stain the uh, this is what we are supposed to see in our biopsy. So there's a big difference. So um, there's another marker for ganglion cells of the colon, which is calretinin, but they have equal specificity and sensitivity. So the pathologic diagnosis for the sigmoidectomy specimen was ischemic colitis in addition to hypogangliosis of the colon. Uh, Postoperatively, she still complained of vomiting, abdominal distension, and constipation. And the CT scan showed right transverse and proximal descending colon were dilated about 7 centimeters and loaded with fecal matter. Uh, with mild regression of the dilated small bowel loops. And she underwent um, uh, functional studies uh, in Cairo, and she was diagnosed with total colonic inertia with small rectocele and peri perineal descent. And she underwent a total colectomy with iliorectal uh, sucrosis. And uh, the bio the, uh, again, I was um, given the uh, specimen for a second opinion, and because I knew the history of the patient, my uh, total concern was to the resection margins of uh, the case. And uh, sure enough, the distal resection margin was ganglionic. And the proximal resection margin was also ganglionic. But there was this peculiar um, lymphoid hyperplasia with the active terminal centers, which you do not expect to see in a 27-year-old female. And this, again, is the Albach's plexus in the distal resection margin. And uh, the one in the proximal resection margin, which were both ganglionic, but the ileum was a bit, um, let's say, borderline. Uh, in addition, I find uh, additional findings in her uh, collecting specimen. She had these ganglia-like uh, uh, structures in the uh, serosal layer, and she had actually ganglion cells, uh, granulomata with multi-nucleate giant cells and inflammatory cells around uh, what I thought were, see this multi-nucleate giant cell engulfing a collagen bundle or a smooth muscle bundle. Uh, so I thought that this patient might have a secondary form of hypotendiosis, not a primary form. And it, uh, what strengthened this um, observation was that she had uh, like um, degenerative changes in the muscle layer, the circuit, the longitudinal muscle layer of the colon. Uh, in segments of uh, her colon. So some segments so, uh, show this type of change with vacuolization uh, of the muscle fibers of the uh, longitudinal muscle layer of the colon, in addition to uh, the thinning of the layer. Uh, just to give you a perspective, other segments of her same, the same colon had this type of muscle layer. So there's a big difference between what you saw here and what I saw here. So. I suggested that this uh, hypogangliosis of the colon uh, was secondary to uh, collagen vascular disease or visceral lichmoniasis, but unfortunately, both markers were negative. Uh, Postoperatively, after the total colectomy, she did well for four days and she started oral feeds. And on the fifth postoperative day, uh, she underwent a CT abdomen with, which showed marked dilatation of the loops of the small bowel and noted minimal pat passage of luminal contrast to the distal ileal, ileal collapsed loops with no signs of bowel ischemia and mild uh, So the, the conclusion reached by uh, the radiologist was um, that this uh, apparent obstruction was secondary to adhesive bowel obstruction. Um, Well, there's a, a slide that I uh, should have put here. That is that uh, she went, she was reopened again after the total collecting of the five days to, in an attempt to relieve this adhesive um, uh, obstruction, and she was closed again. And she still complains of this ongoing constipation, bloating, vomiting, and so on. So, although uncommon, 
other first chronic disease is a cause of chronic constipation and can present acutely with a sigmoid volvulus. A similar case presentation uh, was found in several uh, reports where you had a 12 year old male with a history of chronic constipation presented with vomiting and abdominal distension and was found to have sigmoid volvulus with previously unrecognized HD. 94% of HD cases are diagnosed before the patient reaches five years of age. Mild cases go undiagnosed until the patient reaches adulthood and generally patients can manage by using cathartics. Uh, but at some point, the dilated proximal colonic segment may decompensate secondary to distal obstruction and patient may experience rapidly worsening constipation or even acute obstruction. The prognosis of cases of adult uh, type Hirschsprung disease who are accidentally diagnosed as in this case uh, depends to a large extent on the degree of inflammation which is present in the wall of the collecting specimen. And as you recall that uh, this patient has a significant uh, acute inflammation in her sigmoidectomy and in her collecting specimen. So uh, these patients who have uh, a significant degree of uh, inflammation, active inflammation in their colon do very bad uh, in the post colectomy uh, period. And the ratio of patients with completely no normal bowel function is low. So the take home message here is that uh, an adult, a young adult patient with a uh, long history of chronic constipation, you have to put in mind the possibility of a Hirsch, an undiagnosed Hirschsprung disease.